Hi everyone, my name is Lily Tapchenkova. I'm a research assistant at the Jean Monnet Center for European Studies. Um, this is a part of a series of interviews called EU Policy Interviews. Uh, welcome Professor Zyla, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna get right into it. Uh, how does Brexit affect the EU's common security and defense policy? The European Union is currently exposed to a variety of um, security and foreign policy challenges. Um, and so a situation um, where, you know, kind of extra press pressure sort of has been put on the European Union um, kind of increases the, the sort of internal insecurity um, that we currently face um, or that we currently witness in the European Union. So in other words, and to put it sort of shortly, um, Brexit for the European Union essentially uh, arrives at the wrong time and is most likely to even further destabilize um, the European Union. Um, and I would argue, um, and, and so does the book, um, it would actually harm British um, security interests in the long term. So if we look at the, at the NATO level, um, Brexit also takes place at a, at a sort of very um, unusual moment, perhaps even at a shaky moment. Uh, if we just sort of um, you know, revisit some of the um, issues that NATO has been facing or dealing with over the um, last short period of time, um, perhaps over the past two, three, four years, um, one, of course, is Turkey. Um, Turkey is becoming increasingly an, uh, an autocracy. There's massive human rights violations. Um, there's a question of whether the press is still free. Um, there is um, its geopolitical and foreign policy involvement in Syria, Lebanon, um, and, uh, and other places. And of course, last but not least, there's massive problems with its um, civil-military relations. We uh, may recall the attempted coup um, uh, a few years ago. Um, on the other side of the Atlantic, of course, there's the United States. There's much uncertainty uh, around um, U.S. involvement and engagement um, in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, as the Trump administration has demonstrated very clearly. Um, it decided to, um, to move away from a rules-based international order. Um, it no longer wants to be a global um, hegemon. He doesn't want to take any global leadership anymore. There's a threat of China. Um, and there's, of course, Russia um, occupying uh, Crimea, um, essentially trying to destabilize um, uh, Eastern or, and, and, uh, and Southern European countries. Um, and so there's, there's on, on, on that front, there's, there's quite a bit of sort of momentum in quotation marks, perhaps, um, that um, NATO is, um, is dealing with right now. And of course, we've just seen the report coming out in terms of how to restructure um, NATO um, in um, in the next uh, years to come. And of course, I'm sure we're gonna be talking about this. There's a discussion about um, European strategic autonomy and whether the European Union perhaps needs to acquire more um, capabilities. Um, you also may wanna talk about um, you know, the European refugee crisis um, and the contract that was um, um, struck with, uh, with Turkey to hold back the, the refugees. Um, there is this big, um, massive investment um, plan of the European Commission, the, the so-called European um, Green Deal, um, that wants to um, heavily invest in um, new technology, but also in, in new um, um, sort of climate, climate change uh, mechanisms. And of course, last but not least, um, the, the corona pandemic that has been with us for the past um, sort of um, seven, eight, nine months. Um, that is sort of still on, um, on Europe's um, radar screen and is still um, unsolved. So against this backdrop, um, I think it is very evident that the Brexit um, on its sort of surface touches upon the very basic foundations of European security affairs and the transatlantic relationship in particular. And it will have a significant impact um, on, uh, on, 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 on both sides. On the mission side, um, the uh, um, CSDP, or common, Europe's Common Security and Defense Policy, will lose one of its major shareholders and, of course, a veto player, um, uh, not only um, in the EU, but also um, at the UN side. Because um, if we take this together, both the UK and France alone make up to about 40% of um, 
uh, public defense investments in the European Union. So if, if Britain actually leaves the European Union, it will have a major impact um, on the European Union. And so how do you see British foreign policy objectives and strategic culture changing upon its exit from the Union? Is there a possibility of the UK becoming more isolationist? In terms of European security policy, we're likely to see, I would suggest, that the UK will push for taking Europe's most important military and security decisions inside NATO rather than the European Union. So it will shift its focus and ambitions and commitments towards um, NATO. Its foremost strategic interest, I would suggest, thereby is to um, discourage the EU's efforts to advance its um, quote-unquote strategic autonomy vis-a-vis -vis, um, NATO. Meanwhile, France, um, as Europe's sort of second largest military power and a significant source of um, European force projection, as well as, of course, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, and thus, of course, a, ve a veto power, um, France will be enhanced and upgraded, um, if you want to put it that way. At the same time, um, I think there remain lots of questions, for example, around uh, Britain's financial, personnel, and indeed political commitments to NATO. What will happen, for example, to NATO installations on British soil, including um, its naval ports in Scotland um, that are vitally important for not only the British Navy, um, but also um, for, for NATO um, and, um, and the European Union. And why is that? It's because, well, those ports, um, or many of those ports lie in Scotland, and Scotland, of course, it has indicated that it wants to remain in the European Union, and so there's a tension um, between um, sort of uh, Britain, Scotland, and the European Union, because at the, um, at the lowest end of things, one would ask, um, well, what would actually happen to British members of the um, um, sorry, what would happen to Scottish members of the British Armed Forces in case uh, Britain would leave the European Union? What, what would happen to them? Would they sort of be still part of, um, um, of, 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 of the British forces or would they um, pursue um, rather sort of an autonomy within, um, within the UK and, and within the British forces? So lots of questions um, remain um, unclear. At the end of the day, however, the British government, I think, will have to recognize that the security of the European Union is indivisible from the security of the United Kingdom and vice versa. Also, the challenges faced in security and defense terms will remain quite similar across the channel, um, despite the Brexit. And, and thus, I would argue that there exists a mutual interest for both negotiating parties, that is, um, um, the EU and the UK, um, to have a close cooperation and a pragmatic approach of how to best collaborate in, an order, in order to sort of um, deliver security um, to both the EU citizens as well as um, British citizens. In your opinion, do you think Brexit will make it easier for the EU to achieve what the French President Emmanuel Macron has said, uh, has called strategic autonomy? And will the EU after Brexit move away from NATO? Given that the UK currently is one of seven NATO countries that meets the 2% defense uh, spending as a share of GDP target, I think we're likely to see that the UK will join American voices. Um, we'll still have to see whether the new and incoming Biden administration will have the same voice, but certainly the Trump administration had that voice, namely that the Europeans um, significantly increase their defense spending in NATO. Um, and if that is indeed the case, um, this is not good, good news for um, countries like Germany or Canada, who have been at the lower end of the 2% um, target. Um, we should perhaps recall that the Trump administration called into the question the viability of NATO because, of, because the European members of the alliance, according to him, are not shouldering a fair share of the transatlantic burden. And in consequence, and in part, um, as a counterbalance to the United States, I think it is likely that uh, France and Germany um, will increase their push for more integrated uh, European security defense policy with the rest of the European Union. 
um, and also with the aim to reinforce the European pillar of NATO um, and thus to make it more autonomous uh, from the United States. And I think we see already some sort of handwriting and, um, and, uh, and, and indications um, in, in that regard. Um, more generally speaking, perhaps, the Brexit will most likely affect um, the EU's um, CSDP in, in several ways. And perhaps let me sort of talk about um, um, some of them. Uh, on the one hand, uh, so first, on the one hand, I think the um, European Union would definitely lose um, um, a permanent member of the UN Security Council and thus a veto power, which leaves, of course, France as the only member until um, an eventual UN reform will materialize. And we, of course, don't know when this, uh, when this will happen. Second, the UK's exit um, is also likely to force Germany, together with France, to, pay, to play a more central role in Europe's common and foreign and security policy, also militarily, um, as I think I've, um, I've suggested um, uh, before. Third, um, a Brexit would significantly weaken the role of the European Union as, as an autonomous global actor. Um, as its diplomatic networks and capabilities, as well as soft powers, and we should remember that the UK is uh, is part of a of the Commonwealth and has significant um, soft power resources. Um, but that will it, that it will um, essentially be less influential on the world stage um, um, with, without um, the UK. Um, so, in other words, the 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 European Union cannot tap into the uh, resources that the UK brings to the, um, brings to the table. At the same time, we should also recall that the British government has made it very clear in its statements um, throughout the past two, three uh, years or so that it's actually very interested in continuing to cooperate closely with the European Union post-Brexit, if this should indeed materialize. So there's a, there's a mutual interest um, to remain involved and engaged with the European Union in, uh, in one way or another. In your most recent book titled The End of European Security Institutions, the EU's Common Foreign and Security Policy and NATO after Brexit, you focus on three potential institutional frameworks for cooperation between the UK and the EU after Brexit, PESCO, the European Intervention Initiative, and the UK Joint Expeditionary Force. Could you speak a bit about uh, what cooperation would look like through each of them? So to recall this, the desire to draw benefit from Brexit in order to deepen the integration of European defense and security policy led to the implementation of the Modest Permanent Structured Cooperation or PESCO, which is what we've been talking about for the past um, few years or so. But we should also remember that PESCO is not new. The mechanism has been inserted in the Lisbon Treaty um, and it, to put it sort of simple, PESCO aims to deepen defense cooperation between EU member states that are willing and that are able um, to do so. Um, it envisages the development of special projects to enhance cooperation and interoperability amongst European um, uh, member states, but also vis-a-vis um, -vis NATO. Participation um, in these projects is entirely voluntarily, voluntary, although um, those that have committed to do so um, are bound by, by their commitment, essentially. So all in all, PESCO has made European defense a bit more efficient and provides greater output for boosting the strategic autonomy of the European Union while leaving the member states' sovereignty untouched, because that is always um, the, the tricky issue with the European Union and their that, that member states feel that their sovereignty is being um, touched when it comes to um, their foreign and, and uh, security policy. So in short, we may say that PESCO enables defense cooperation uh, in smaller committed groups below the threshold of the 27 member states and within the European um, framework uh, rather than outside it. So that's kind of the mechanism that, that PESCO is and that it, is, that it provides. However, um, I would argue that the structure and setup of PESCO entails a number of problems. Um, so perhaps let me talk about those um, very briefly. Firstly, um, since membership in PESCO is limited to European member states, this by definition essentially would exclude participation 
um, in case the British um, indeed leave uh, the European Union. Um, so the British would essentially be out. Um, although we can say, and we know that the British government has already asked uh, the European Union to, um, to uh, participate in individual projects um, of PESCO as a third country, but it still remains unclear whether the European Union actually wants to uh, allow that and whether it's sort of willing to move forward under, um, under these conditions. Secondly, the ambition of the respective projects has been very modest, I think we would have to find. Um, and they're very limited to enhance the cooperation um, amongst the European member states and in sort of very closely defined areas. On the European Intervention Initiatives or E2I, um, we may recall that in September 2017, Emmanuel Macron launched the idea of a European Intervention Initiative or E2I, EI2, sorry, E2I. The overarching aim is to equip Europe by the beginning of the next decade, um, so around 2030 or so, with a common intervention force, um, as well as a common defense budget and a common sort of doctrine for action to enable Europeans to act um, convincingly together um, in, in military terms. But again, participation is by invitation only. Um, a letter of intent launching the initiative was signed by nine European countries, that is, um, if I remember correctly, Belgium, Denmark, Estonia, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, and the UK um, in the summer of uh, 2018. The European Intervention Initiative essentially will be a flexible and a non-binding forum of European member states that are able and willing to engage their military forces when and where necessary in order to uh, protect European security in interests um, across the spectrum, or the, the, so the whole spectrum of uh, crisis management and without prejudice to the framework through which um, this action um, is taken. So this could be either through the UN, NATO, um, or of course um, the European Union, or um, also on sort of ad hoc coalitions. Participation in any of its sort of specific initiatives or any military operations that result will be subject to sovereign national decision making, which is of course um, one of the problems or obstacles to, to overcome. The European Intervention Initiative operates independently um, of the European Union military staff and its committee, and thereby sort of enables the creation of a more flexible adaptable and more responsive leadership um, structure to work with. Given that the European Intervention Initiative is a defensive um, initiative outside of the governance purview of the European Union, British participation in such initiative will not be affected in any way or form by the Brexit. So this may actually be uh, a possibility for the UK to remain connected to um, the, uh, the European Union. And last but not least, um, the UK Joint um, Expeditionary Force, or JEF, um, which is um, kind of an alternative forum for um, pragmatic cooperation um, inside the NATO um, framework nations um, concept. It was created in 2012 and it builds on the UK experience in working with other um, European countries, um, especially in Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. It initially focused on the Near and Middle East, um, and it was subsequently um, redirected to address the Russian threat uh, within the context of the annexation of Crimea and the destabilization of Eastern Ukraine. It is made up of uh, British-led forces, um, to which eight other countries, to my knowledge, thus far contribute, and um, it tries to seek and achieve sort of a rapid deployment um, of forces, and particularly in, uh, in, in Northern uh, uh, Europe. Three of these are sort of long-standing members, um, Denmark, Norway, and the Netherlands. Um, and three are relatively new members, um, namely Estonia, um, Latvia, and um, Lithuania, if I recall correctly, um, as well as two neutral member states, EU member states, namely um, Sweden and Finland. 
Um, although falling within the NATO framework, um, the deployment of the Joint Expeditionary Force is a sovereign decision of the British government. Um, and this results in a much more perhaps flexible and more mobile instrument than, for example, the very high readiness um, task force, which can only be deployed uh, within the approval um, of all 29 full members um, of the um, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So in some, I think it's likely that the UK will be involved in the EU's institutional security defense framework in one way or another. Um, but most likely, I would suggest um, through the initiatives of the um, E2I or the JAF. How do you think the EU will be impacted by Brexit in terms of their security and intelligence capabilities? That's a good question. Um, the UK is a member of the so-called Five Eyes Intelligence Community, which I've suggested before. And, and those uh, countries that are part of that community include the UK, uh, of course, the US, Canada, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, after the Brexit, it remains doubtful whether the UK will indeed maintain its close intelligence sharing network across the um, British Channel, the English Channel, and that is, of course, with the European Union, or alternatively, whether London can continue to rely on the EU's intelligence data and information, and of course, those of its member states, and share that essentially with um, the UK's MI5 and, and MI6. So in other words, what we're seeing is we're currently, we see a, a very closely interwoven um, network between European and British um, security um, institutions, um, which of course has been um, questioned um, or would be questioned if Britain leaves the, uh, the UK. I just noticed that my phone went dark. Um, so I think, oh, okay. Um, up until the Brexit referendum in 2016, these intelligence exchanges were important institutional and cross-border networks the um, UK could always rely on and, um, and count on as a support. For example, in their fight against radical extremism in the UK, as well as abroad, as well as terrorism and organized crime more broadly speaking. So in other words, whether these intelligence networks will remain sort of live, active, and accessible after the, um, the Brexit, um, it remains very unclear at this particular moment, um, and which I think under, still underlines the, the importance to, um, to have an agreement in, in this regard and to, to work out the details in that regard. In contrast, the consequences of Britain sort of restricting or even cutting access to intelligence information would be significant for all parties uh, involved, essentially. For example, for um, policing purposes in terms of uh, one, the abilities to fight uh, against terrorism, B, defense against um, cyber attacks, C, maintaining access to the Schengen information system for broader control, uh, passenger information lists, and so forth. Um, and D, um, the Europol um, law enforcement, uh, enforcement database, um, as well as the European criminal records information system. So um, if, if there's no agreement worked out between the um, EU and, um, and, and the UK, uh, Britain would essentially lose access um, to, to those kinds of um, information system and essentially would be downgraded um, um, in its relationship with the EU in, in that regard, and which I think would be harmful for the British uh, internal as well as security interests um, in the long term. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident that both parties um, have, uh, will sort of overcome their, um, their, their, their sort of negotiation hurdles and, and come to an agreement in that regard, because it would also be in the interest of the European Union to uh, be able to access um, British um, intelligence assets. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today and to uh, provide your insights on the subject. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.